Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am Longevity. I just read a clinical trial still being conducted on rapamycin and exercise. The authors of this study are Dr. Brad Stanfield and Matt Caberline, PhD expert on rapamycin and longevity. I mentioned this before on my channel and I have made a video on rapamycin and its dangers to muscle health. The link is in the upper right corner. Now back to the ongoing study in question. The objective of this study is to investigate the effects of rapamycin, a well-known mTOR inhibitor, on exercise outcomes in 40 older adults between the age of 65 and 85. Rapamycin has been widely studied for its potential on anti-aging properties and its ability to modulate mTOR pathway, which plays a critical role in muscle growth, metabolism, and protein synthesis. Understanding the biases and weaknesses in clinical trials like this is essential particularly when they involve complex interactions between pharmaceuticals and exercise. These studies often face challenges due to factors such as participant variability, unstandardized protocols, and the need to control for external influences, which can all lead to skewed or misleading results. One key weakness in this study is the lack of standardized diet for the participants. The absence of controlled nutritional intake, particularly protein and leucine, may introduce significant variability in the results. Leucine plays a critical role in the activation of the mTOR pathway, which is essential for muscle protein synthesis. Participants with differing protein and leucine consumption may experience varying levels of mTOR activation, leading to inconsistent muscle growth responses. This variability complicates the study's ability to accurately assess the effects of rapamycin on exercise outcomes. By not controlling for dietary intake, the study risks an uncontrollable variable influencing the exercise results, particularly for participants who consume low-protein diets. These differences in nutrition can obscure the true effects of rapamycin, potentially making the results less reliable. Another significant weakness in the study is the assumption that simple exercises like the chair, stand test, and the exercise cycle can effectively stimulate mTOR, even with rapamycin in the system. Rapamycin inhibits mTOR, which plays a central role in muscle growth and adaptation to exercise. Without clarity on how these exercises will counteract this inhibition, there is a concern about the study's ability to assess muscle improvements. The mechanical stress from these basic endurance exercises might not be sufficient to activate mTOR in the presence of rapamycin. This is especially concerning for all the populations who may also suffer from anabolic resistance further reducing the exercise's effectiveness. Assuming that all forms of exercise equally stimulate mTOR without adjusting for the intensity or type of exercise, e.g. resistance or explosive exercises, may result in skewed conclusions. If the exercises are not intense enough, the study may underestimate the effectiveness of exercise or overestimate rapamycin's influence on muscle outcomes. Another critical weakness of the study is that it doesn't account for anabolic resistance, a common condition in older adults where the body's muscle protein synthesis response to exercise and dietary protein intake becomes blunted. This reduced ability to build muscle means that older adults require more intense stimuli, either from higher protein intake or more challenging exercise, to achieve the same muscle growth as a younger person. If participants in the study are experiencing anabolic resistance, it will significantly impair their muscle protein synthesis regardless of whether they are exercising or taking rapamycin. This could undermine the effectiveness of both interventions in promoting muscle growth, skewing the study's results. Without screening for or adjusting the study to account for anabolic resistance, researchers might incorrectly attribute poor muscle growth outcomes to the effects of rapamycin, when in fact the underlying anabolic resistance in the older participants could be the real cause. This introduces the risk of misinterpreting the findings, especially in an older population, like in this study between the age of 65 and 85. A notable concern is that rapamycin has long lasting effects remaining active in the body for an extended period beyond the day of administration. Rapamycin is known to inhibit the mTOR pathway, a critical regulator of muscle growth, and the drug can remain effective in the body for more than a week after a single dose. If participants are receiving weekly doses of rapamycin, like in this study, it is likely that mTOR inhibition is occurring continuously throughout the week, not just on the day of dosing. This extended presence could impair muscle protein synthesis and recovery from exercise during the entire week, regardless of when the exercise is performed. 
This effect may reduce the effectiveness of any exercise intervention aimed at promoting muscle growth. Failing to account for the prolonged activity of rapamycin in the body introduces the risk of misinterpreting the results. Muscle growth and recovery might be consistently suppressed due to the drug's lingering effects, leading researchers to incorrectly conclude that the exercise regimen is ineffective or that rapamycin is more detrimental to muscle health than it might be under different dosing schedules. Another thing, the study places significant emphasis on muscle mass but overlooks muscle quality, which is crucial, especially in older adults. Muscle quality refers to the muscle's ability to generate power and perform quick, forceful movement. This capacity declines with age, largely due to the loss of fast twitch muscle fibers and high threshold motor units. For older adults, maintaining muscle mass is important, but it is the quality characterized by strength, power, and agility that contributes more directly to physical function and independence. After the age of 65, many individuals experience a decline in fast twitch muscle fibers and their motor units. The average person loses about 50% of their motor units by age 75 and about 90% in older age. Once lost, these fibers and motor units cannot be regained. As a result, the ability to perform high intensity explosive movements deteriorates, which impacts overall mobility and balance. Rapamycin and the endurance-based exercises used in this study, such as chair stands and exercise cycle, cannot restore or slow the loss of fast twitch muscle fibers and their high threshold motor units. These fibers are essential for maintaining muscle quality, particularly in older people. Without incorporating exercises that specifically target these fibers, such as plyometric or resistance power training, the study's approach may fail to address the real needs of older adults concerning muscle quality. The lack of focus on explosive, high-intensity exercises represents a significant limitation in accurately measuring functional muscle improvements. One other thing, the sit-to-stand test, while useful for assessing functional lower body strength and muscle power, has a potential limitation that could affect the accuracy of its results, the impact of the participant's height and weight. Variations in its physical attributes may influence the number of sit-to-stand a participant can perform, Taller or heavier participants may find it more difficult to complete the same number of repetitions due to the increased effort required to stand up from a fixed high chair, leading to a possible underestimation of their muscle power. On the other hand, lighter or shorter participants may find the tasks easier, potentially leading to overestimated results. Given that the sit-to-stand test calculates muscle power by factoring in body mass chair height and the time taken to complete the movement, these differences should be accounted for to avoid skewed data. Without adjusting for height and weight variations, the test results may not accurately reflect true muscle power, thus introducing a flaw in the study's design. In closing, this study investigating the interaction of rapamycin with exercise regimens presents several important considerations. While rapamycin has potential benefits for longevity, it introduces complexities when combined with exercise, especially, especially in older populations. Key weaknesses such as variability in participants' diets, a lack of focus on muscle quality over muscle mass, and the study's reliance on basic endurance exercise may limit its findings. Additionally, older adults face anabolic resistance and the permanent loss of fast switch fibers and their motor units, which simple exercises and rapamycin cannot restore. These overlooked factors create potential biases, suggesting that the study might not fully capture the intervention's true impact. For more accurate results, future studies should address these limitations by controlling dietary intake, incorporating high-intensity explosive exercises, and accounting for the long-term effects of rapamycin in aging populations. I just wanted to give my take. I read this study thoroughly. There's a lot of flaws in it. I'm sorry. I, I don't believe in rapamycin. I believe rapamycin damages your muscles. It doesn't matter if it keeps your muscle mass. It's not, it's not muscle mass that counts in older age. It's the muscle quality. We lose a fast twitch muscle fiber. The objective is to concentrate on slowing down the loss of fast twitch fibers and their motor units. This is what keeps youthful muscles, not muscle mass. Muscle mass has no relevance. Anyway, this is just my take on the study. With all due respect to Dr. Stanfield and Mr. Matt Caberline, there's a lot of flaws in this study that will skew the results. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a wonderful day. 
I just wanted to share my thoughts. Have a wonderful day.